So uh, I'm Austin Hill. I've worn a bunch of hats, but first and foremost, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I did a lot of work in the area of cryptography, privacy, anonymity, and electronic cash with a company called Zero Knowledge Systems that uh, was started in 1997, uh, still exists, but we moved away from a lot of the crypto in the dot-com crash. But there was a period of time where I employed pretty much a huge amount of the core cypherpunks, many of whom had done a lot of the early work on electronic cash systems, including Adam, who worked with me for four years. And uh, Adam recently came to me and uh, started talking to me about a new project. And uh, he and a few of the Bitcoin core developers had invented some new extensions to the blockchain. And uh, he wanted my help to uh, build a company around it and to really focus on the idea of a blockchain 2.0 that was forward and backward compatible with the existing blockchain, but could address a lot of the issues of scalability, pace of invention, uh, transaction throughput, uh, multi-asset issuance, uh, and extensions to the smart contract scripting language. So uh, he and I are doing this now, and uh, we're working with a number of the core developers to uh, kind of make a new platform available that uh, we feel will be exciting to the community. So when you say to make a new platform available, now, uh, I remember the interview that uh, Adam Back did with uh, Andreas Antonopoulos back in December, and there was talk about like a a test blockchain that could have uh, features incorporated back into the primary one. Is this the idea that you're talking about? Uh, yes, that's that's the basis of it. Um, at the time, I was talking about a concept I came up with uh, early last year called a one-way peg. And since then, Greg Maxwell uh, proposed a two-way peg um, between Bitcoin and a sidechain, which is uh, even more interesting because um, with a one-way peg, you're slightly subject to market conditions, and you can only really do it in the context of a, a planned upgrade as a kind of, um, you know, Bitcoin current versus Bitcoin beta and then a switch over date, let's say 18 months in the future and being able to move coins forwards into the new network and backwards either at market rate or via swapping with other people who want to get in. Now, a two-way peg allows you with a small change to Bitcoin main to mathematically peg between the main Bitcoin network and a sidechain network. So then that can be used in, in, the, in, in a wider set of contexts, including sort of an ongoing alternative sidechains optimized for different purposes. And there can actually be multiple sidechains which are competing on features. So, for example, one could have a higher, a larger block size, which may incur some centralization risk potentially, but get uh, higher transactions per second, and the users would be able to unilaterally remove their coins from it and put them back into the main Bitcoin chain. So that, that would kind of act as a backstop against centralization risk. If you run into the side effects of centralization risk, you'd have the last resort of removing your coins. So that kind of insulates you from that risk. So my mind is expanding a little bit here, and I'm going to try and understand what you're telling me. So what you're saying is that we can essentially have multiple chains that are all Bitcoin, but they don't all have their own type of Bitcoin. Basically, or rather, they don't all each have their own money supply. The money supply can move from one chain to another wherever it has the most advantage for the person who's using it at that point, and then it can move back again if it's better used in another chain. Is that right? The key idea here is to protect the concept of digital scarcity and the 21 million Bitcoin limit. And so by linking chains, what we do is we essentially set Bitcoin up as a a transactional currency for all the innovation and for all new assets. So you can uh, potentially issue shares in a side chain and have a side chain that's specifically designed around smart contracts for shares, derivatives, uh, you know, other types of issued assets. And they're ultimately backed by Bitcoin. And so you can peg them to Bitcoin. Right. So, so um, Bitcoin becomes, I mean, so, so typically various share related uh, cryptocurrency ideas or math-based currencies. So for example, Ripple has XRPs, Mastercoin has Mastercoins, Ethereum has Ethers. ColorCoin has nothing, right? Because ColorCoin is just watermarking on top of Bitcoin. So one 
Artificial scarcity race, and do we think I think it's um, fair at this point. I think we talked. To, I talked about this with Andreas a lot on my last interview. Is it's fairer if we just use the existing scarcity race because it, it was a surprise. People for the first couple of years didn't have a strong reason to suppose that Bitcoin would succeed and it would bootstrap to a stable value. You know, some volatility, but still a stable, persistent value. Now, if you start a new scarcity race, it's it's a kind of known quantity, right? That you're hoping strongly that's, that that process is going to get repeated. So, and each time you have a, a new scarcity race, it creates an interoperability silo. Your only way to get into there or to write contracts against it is at market swapping coins between different networks. So, by pegging to Bitcoin, it's it turns out that it's possible to have uh, side chains with additional features or you know, faster transactions, more transactions per second, direct support for issued assets, smart contracts, extended smart contracts, um, all while using Bitcoin itself as the transactional currency. So we feel that's a neutral choice. I mean, it's the main choice right now, and it's a neutral choice. It's not, it's not starting, you know, a cryptocurrency that's owned by one company, one project, a small group of developers or early speculators who... Um, you know, if the project succeeds wildly, will become exceedingly rich. This is a, a kind of a, more of a neutral stance. So when people talk about building on top of TCP, I think this is this is actually the way to do it, which is the the interoperability using bitcoins themselves, existing bitcoins from the Bitcoin network, and being able to move them. You know, so the example would be: I have I have a bitcoin I bought on the Bitcoin network. I want to use it for small payments to buy a cup of coffee, that kind of thing from my smartphone, I move it into a side chain which has a larger block and so more transactions per second. Uh, when I finish with that, I move the change back into the main Bitcoin network and then I move it into a different side chain because I want to make some investments and buy some, you know, a Bitcoin denominated derivative against US dollars or buy some electronic shares or something like that. So you can use Bitcoin as an interoperability level, moving, moving them across the pegs, basically. And it allows open innovation in a, in a neutral sense, you know, w- without attaching to new scarcity races. So we've recently seen a fairly popular altcoin, Aurora coin, come under a 51% time warp attack. And this is because the amount of hashing power in the network dropped off. And it was relatively easy for, you know, a malicious mining group to go in there and kind of mess up their day. So when you're talking about adding additional side chains, do these side chains get all the security of the main Bitcoin si- of the main Bitcoin chain, or do they each need to be mined, whether through a merged mining process or through something something separate? Are there security implications? Here is the question. A large part of what we're doing is uh, building the infrastructure so that these side chains can come online and take full advantage of the global hash rate through things like merged mining, but with some additional extensions because there's some core services that you want. For instance, uh, good PKI for the registry, digitally signing for new asset issuers and side chains, clear disclosure. If people are able to move Bitcoins in and out of these networks, it should be obvious to a number of the wallets out there what these side chains are. What are the properties of the side chain? So when you get an asset from that side chain, you actually are the wallets are aware. So there's a lot of really important infrastructure that needs to be done. But a key part of that is making sure that we're Rate. We don't see a justification for you know, a lot of these altcoins switching out the proof of work, aside from Adam's contribution in inventing Hashcash. It ignores close to $200, $250 million worth of ASICs and hardware and data centers that Bitcoin is self-funded as a platform for verification. And so uh, the idea of trying something new and trying to bootstrap a new global hash rate infrastructure, we think is kind of pointless. It makes a lot more sense to use what's out there, very similar to how Namecoin has achieved, you know, 85 or 90 percent of the Bitcoin hash rate through merge mining. You can do the same thing, but there are supporting services that need to be built for the ecosystem to be trusted. You know, if this had happened nine months ago, it would have been a whole new slew of innovative features that I've just heard you list. But now it kind of comes against a backdrop of some competition moving into the space. I wonder, what does this do to protocols that have been building on top of Bitcoin? Does this obsolete their approach? Is this just the way that everybody should be doing everything when it comes to these things? 
I think it's a preferable approach because it's an interoperable approach. You can move money around and interoperate between different uh, different networks, different sidechains. People like to talk about this TCP analogy, usually quite inaccurately. You know, for example, that they're going to build on top of Bitcoin by sending messages that are actually watermarked Bitcoin transactions. And I mean, that doesn't really make sense because you know. With TCP, you're sending like user messages on top of TCP IP, but that's a point-to-point communication link. If you send them over the Bitcoin network, it's an N-squared broadcast, and the things that go on the Bitcoin network should be strictly about the minimum amount of data necessary <coughs> to ensure the Bitcoin properties, you know, so um, that the value transfer can be tracked, the smart contracts can be evaluated. I mean, the small smart contracts like you know, multi-sig and so on. And so it should, it should be minimal data, like any data about, you know, oh, this is my email address or this is a receipt or a description of the product. All, all that kind of thing doesn't belong on the Bitcoin network. And that's what the payment protocol is for. So the payment protocol is point to point between people. And when, when the payment protocol is done, a transaction focus message gets broadcast onto the Bitcoin network. So I think some of the people who are talking about building on top of Bitcoin are doing it in a naive way, which is likely to cause disruption for Bitcoin. So, for example, even ColorCoin, which is which is quite neutral and clean, I mean, it's it's there's no digital scarcity race attached to it, to scalability issues, because if the share trading involving ColorCoin reached a significant level, it could saturate the Bitcoin network. I mean, right now, Bitcoin is transaction limited, around seven transactions per second. And while the block size could be increased, increasing the block size tends to incur centralization risk because you need high-speed links, you know, data center grade bandwidth to keep up if that gets too large. When Adam worked with me in the 90s, he had shown me uh, some work he did, which was essentially colored coins with uh, David Sholm's eCash server. He had come up with the idea of coloring DigiCash coins and watermarking them and even last year, he st- still thought it was the best approach to add extensions. But then we started to look at the ecosystem and saw, you know, with SPV wallets, uh, it, color coins don't work with SPV wallets. And we do live in a world where mobile phones are uh, a predominant device. So if Bitcoin is going to reach its full potential of reaching uh, or interacting with billions of people, Color coins just doesn't work in that scenario because you can't have a full node on a, a smartphone. On top of which, no one had really contemplated how will this capability of watermarking work? If two different people want to register that a coin is blue and one person thinks that means it's a share and another person means it's a copyright registration and they both encode it blue, who's the ultimate arbiter? So there were there were ideas, but no one had really thought out how do color coins work in the Bitcoin ecosystem with SPV aware clients, with some sort of asset registry, whether you do that on a distributed basis like Namecoin does, or you do it uh, in a centralized PKI uh, digitally signed registry service, there needs to be supporting infrastructure to make something like that work. And no one had really thought about that. I think everyone got enamored with the idea of colored coins. And kind of ran off and said, let's just watermark a bunch of things. So, you know, Adam, after looking at it, really abandoned that idea and focused on how can we allow for uh, some of the properties of native marketing of new asset issuance, uh, extensions to the scripting, uh, build on a neutral uh, platform. I mean, the principles for our new project are principles derived right from Bitcoin, permissionless innovation decentralized wherever possible, decentralized and distributed. And, you know, one of the core principles, and we'll be releasing this uh, in more detail once we announce the name of the project and some of the people involved, but the founding principle, when I flew out to work with Adam after he came to recruit me out of retirement, uh, he literally came and knocked me on the head and said, pay attention to Bitcoin. And I had played with it. But, you know, I had spent almost $4 million trying to develop electronic cash. So I still had some battle scars. <laughs> it was kind of like, I'm glad someone did it, but I'm not sure if I really want to get back in that game. And Adam came and knocked me on the head uh, and said, Austin, you need to pay attention to Bitcoin. And once I did and saw what he saw, 
I flew out and we spent a week in a boardroom together just mapping out uh, an ecosystem that I really wanted to get involved and help build. And the number one principle we wrote down on the board was can't be evil. And that's an important distinction from the, the some of the other people who have tried to adhere to principles. And it's very inspired by what we did at Zero Knowledge. We built, we believed in cryptographic systems whereby trust wasn't earned because we were good guys, but trust was based off the protocols, the white paper, and the cryptography where we were not asking for trust. This is Chris Joseph bringing you news on Next for April 8th, 2014. It was a bright, cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. The opening sentence of George Orwell's 1984 holds as much significance for Next's creator as the number 21 does. And on April 4th, the third and final part of BC Next's essay on Next was released. BC Next has left the Next community and is no longer responsible for its future direction. In his message, BC Next says that Next will fail unless the community rallies behind it and keeps it running. He argues that that mathematical algorithms are not sufficient to immortalize Bitcoin or Next because math cannot account for the imperfection of humanity. BC Next says that Bitcoin and Next are stepping stones and that his main project will be released in the future under his own name. You can read BC Next's full message, all three parts, on the Next Wiki at wiki.nextcrypto.org. For more general information on Next, head to nextcrypto.org or mynext.org. And stay tuned for more news on Next in the next Let's Talk Bitcoin broadcast. <laughs>